Good morning, everyone. Can the people in the back row hear me okay? Let's try and get started. Um, is, you can hear me okay up in the back row? Good, okay. My name is Rod Grimes. Um, probably everyone in here knows who I am by now. The talk is a, a brief history of some of the early time of FreeBSD, some of it before FreeBSD even started, um, up to about maybe release 1.5 or, or 2 would be the time frame. Um, I want to ask if there's anybody in the room that was in the project before the end of 94. Please raise your hand. I want to recognize some people. I believe, Doug, you were Justin Warner before the end of 94. Yeah, yeah, not at the beginning of 94. These are some, so we've got a group of some of the very early people here. Um, unfortunately, many of the early people are no longer with the project. Um, they've moved on to other things for one thing or another. Um, the 386 um, BSD patch kit came about because there was a, the 386 release was out there at 0 0.1. There were lots of changes floating all over the internet. Um, nobody was really collecting them, and you kind of went around and you grabbed this patch from so-and-so and this patch from so-and-so, and when you tried to integrate those into a source tree, you were running into conflicts because the same people were changing the same sets of code, um, especially in the networking area, um, there's the drivers, that kind of stuff. So a gentleman named Terry Lambert started this idea, well, let's make a patch kit and collect all these patches together, resolve out the conflicts between them, and give a, a way for a person to maintain a source tree that included a large number of patches and the ability to back those patches out and put new ones in as the patch kit evolved. Um, it was somewhere, it was several thousand lines of shell script. Um, and that was done for portability because we needed to be able to patch this system basically on any Unix platform because you weren't necessarily putting your sources together on a hosted system. It was self-hosting at that time, but build world and those types of things just didn't exist. Um, there were a lot of make files. All the make files were there to build the individual binaries, but there was no way to do a complete tree traversal and build the whole pack, the whole system. After the patch kit was around, I think it was maybe nine months, um, Jordan Hubbard, um, who's another name that you should all recognize or hopefully recognize, approached Walnut Creek CD-ROM about making a CD of this product project. And, and um, Walnut Creek was, was very receptive to that idea. Um, and we decided there was a mutual agreement between a couple of people that, yeah, let's kind of go do this and see where it goes. There wasn't any, we didn't have any project. We didn't have any formal, um, we, di we, we, di I, we didn't even have formal mailing lists at that time. And, Walnut Creek went out and bought some hardware and to, for us to have a host. They had a T1 at that time, which was pretty good bandwidth back in 1993. Um, and they were going to let us use it, which was an even better idea for us. So they went and bought some hardware so we could put up a 386 BSD box running at their site. Well, in those days, it was hard to just go into a computer store and buy hardware that would run BSD. You had to be pretty careful about what you bought. And um, Jack Velte was walked through a install of 386 BSD on the hardware, and it ran for about six hours and fell over and started panicking. And it wouldn't run for more than three or four hours. So that hardware was boxed up and shipped to me in Portland to fix. And it actually is what turned out, if I remember right, it had a cache problem. The cache chips in it weren't capable of, of um, keeping up with how hard we were pounding on them. And it, was just, it was a matter of replacing all the cache chips with a higher speed cache chip, sending, the, sending it back down. And it got us bootstrapped. Um, I had the fortunate benefits because the machine was in my hands and being reconstructed and we were going to reload it from scratch. I named it. Um, I have a history of skydiving, and that's where the name Freefall came from. And that's. Uh, a lot of people have asked about that over the years, about why that name was chosen and stuff, and it was just, well, it's free fall. I had other machines named Ground Rush and Sky Rush that have, are also skydiving related um, names. 
ground rush and sky rush, which are, are two aspects that occur during skydiving. If you if you're go below pull altitude, the earth appears to explode below you as you get closer and closer to the ground. Hopefully you do something before you get there. <laughs> or, or wearing something that does something for you before you get there. Yes, and I'm not sure who named that. Now, I don't know if I named it or if that was a Jordan going, look at what happens if you don't. <laughs> um, and in fact, there, there were some other machines there because I'm trying to, I, there's a physical image or a me mental image in my head of the physical room where these machines were located. They moved at one time. They were in one room. Um, free fall set on one machine. After I had gone down to Walnut Creek, the FTP.CD-ROM was built, which was probably a host name I should have mentioned. Um, I built the first FTP.CD-ROM um, at Jack Belty's request in that they had been hosting some small FTP sites on a Sun 4, and they wanted to do something bigger. And part of that was um, one of the large mirrors was shutting down. I can't remember who it was. They wanted to pull, pull a, one, I shouldn't have said mirrors. One of the large FTP sites was shutting down, and they wanted to bring a copy of that over before it went away. Uh, huh? Was that no, no, I don't think it was Simtel, um, but it may have been. Anyway, so they had this idea to, to bring it in and host it themselves. So I built another machine called FTP.CDROM.com. The two machines sat in a rather large room side by side. Um, Freefall wasn't anything more than a, a mid-tower size case. It had, I think, one four gigabyte SCSI hard drive in it. Um, I believe the very first one only had four meg of memory. It may have had 16. Oh, it quickly got 16. <laughs> um, th those two machines later moved into another room due to expansion of Walnut Creek. They needed more office space. So we moved the FreeBSD projects in with the um, Walnut Creek server into a back server room. And I'm trying, I seem to remember that there were five machines in there. One of them would have been Walnut Creek server. So there's, there's four other machines, which is FTP, Freefall, and I don't know if it was Thud at that time or not. And there may have been a machine called time.cdrom.com. But those machines were some of the very early ones. Um, later host names, Jordan, when Jordan came over um, much later, the, his whiskers machine, I think, went into that same, same arena. Justin would know. Um, we didn't even have a project name at that time, so the host name actually came before the project. Um, how we ended up with free in both is a mystery, other than it may have tickled D David Greenman's name. The, I want to say there was about a dozen of us that were pretty actively involved in the patch kit and the starting of this project. And basically the idea that, that we could pull together and do this um, was managed by a mailing list that Nate Williams did, who's the third member of the, the founding three. Um, at University of Montana. And we had a little ma mailing list. It wasn't even Major Dome. I think it was a send mail alias with just a list of the people in it. And if we needed to add somebody to it, we just added them. And somebody, somebody's mail started getting bounced. They just got deleted. Um, it, it wasn't, huh? It still works that way, right? Well, kind of. Fortunately, I haven't been deleted for some of my mail bounces, but they rarely last for more than a day. Um, so any, anyway, this group of people kicked around a whole bunch of different ideas, and I'm not going to go over any of the names because I can't even remember all of them. The one that stuck, we all know today, is FreeBSD. It was picked by David Greenman. The group, basically, we voted on a list of names, and that was the one that everybody liked the most. And so you can blame our name on David Greenman. We didn't have a repository at that point. So we, some tool selection, I think, had been done. The, whether the name was picked before the repository was created or not, I'm not real clear on. A lot was going on at the same time. So anyway, so, so creation of the repository involved taking all of the 386 BSD sources that were distributed by Bill Jolitz on um, uh, 
couple of different Berkeley mirrors, and somebody else had a copy of them. Anyway, those were downloaded, expanded out into a, the, the original ones were chunked up into floppy sized pieces. Um, this is the days of 14.4 and 28.8 modems, so you didn't want to try and download eight megabytes of source code all at once. Um, so anyway, I had, I had the wonderful task. If somebody else picked the tools. Um, I don't think I had much input to it, and it was gone. Okay, we're going to we're, we're do our source code control in CVS. And so I went, okay, I've got to go figure out what this thing that's called CVS is, because I've never seen it before. I was familiar with some of the predecessors, SCCS and the RCS stuff that was used at the university. Um, so I had to go quickly grab the CVS pack and read through all of that and figure out how to put a repository together. And then one, there were several people in the projects that had worked with CVS. Somebody pointed me to a set of tools that create something called the CVS root administrative directory that gives you things like, OK, we can decide who gets to do commits. And we can produce these really nice mail logs. Um, Major Domo got dropped in my lap, and I'm not even sure how quickly that came in. I think it was pretty early in the project, um, probably before commits. I'm not even sure if the very first commits went out in Major Domo mailing list. We had to have some way to ma manage our mailing list that had been up at Montana um, and move those to Walnut Creek. But um, the initial codes were imported, and then I, had, I went through the patch kit, which at that time I believe was 70-some patches, and brought those patches in one at a time. So they were all in isolated individual commits with all of the information that we had about who had developed them, what they were changing, why they were changing it, that kind of stuff. So we had some history to start with. Um, and once that was done, we figured out, well, OK, now we've got to be able to make it so that everybody can get to this stuff. And so we started adding accounts to Freefall so that literally you did all of your, your committing work on Freefall. Many people did compiles and test builds over there and stuff. I mean, you don't, want to, you don't want to haul it off to your machine and then have the rest of the tree evolving outside of you, and you're trying to get this, just this little piece of code fixed. Um, we, cook, we quickly ate through four gigabyte hard drives. It was, it was pretty easy to do. Um, and that's kind of how the repository started going. And, and, and it, was, it was available. I'm trying to think if, I can't even remember how we distributed it at first. I don't think we had SUP. CVS SUP wasn't available at that point in time. Um, I think a lot of guys just checked out source trees and, and tarred them up and downloaded them. CTM came, CTM came in post one release. I'm predominantly talking about this is before 1.0, and we don't have a release yet. Um, was, was SUP being used then? Because I remember, I remember so, hearing that it was fairly early. No, SUP, SUP, I don't, no, SUP, no, no, SUP, SUP, SUP it's, yeah, the non, yes, we, the, there's CVS SUP and there's SUP, and we did use just SUP in the very, very early days, but I don't know that we had it day one. Or I shouldn't say day one. I should say in the first six months. Um, TAR and FTP. <laughs> we didn't, we, um, I don't, it was, we, we never did it with our disk unless it was done individually. Some, I mean, there's no reason that somebody can't set up their own R disk and point it at it and send it. Um, so it probably came in pretty early. Um, Julian Elsher was a big um, help in that because he was already somewhere where they were using SUP. Um, I have the ominous task of being the person responsible for the core team. Um, there's not very much documentation on this piece of history. I was in a position at Walnut Creek. Jordan was in um, Ireland working for Lotus, Lotus yes. And <laughs> I'm not, it, in 1992, I was not a technical expert on all of BSD. I had worked in many operating systems internals. I had a pretty good footing in operating systems, but I didn't know the VM system like the back of my hand. So I needed people that did um, as technical advisors to what we were trying to do and to make sure that we didn't do stupid things. Kirk was at the um, University of California and wasn't really available to us. He was still doing CSRG work. We needed file system experts. 
We need a device driver expert. Um, we needed user lands. I'm not a user land person, as much as I've done in user land. Um, we needed people that were experts in many, many different areas. So I just started collecting people. Um, some of them came very willing to the idea of the core team. Some of them did, took a lot of persuasion to go, look, you know, we really, really need you. Um, some of them had conflicts with other things going on that precluded them from becoming, they, could, they said, yeah, I'll, I'll work with the project, but no, I don't think it would be a good idea if I sat on the core team of it. There may be conflicts with my employer, there may be conflicts with other things they were doing. Um, I can't even remember what the exact size of the initial core team was. I think it was nine, and it's still nine. I don't know. Has that number changed over time, Justin? Okay. Yeah, it, it was, I'm remembering about eight or nine people that were, were there. Um, so we went on to spend, I'm not even sure what the exact time frame is. I believe it was um, April or May of 93 when I went down to Walnut Creek cd rom And I don't think it was till December that we spun the 1.0 alpha, <laughs> the very, very first copy. Um, of, of FreeBSD. So I have the wonderful chore of creating the release engineering position because that's, it wasn't, there wasn't even a position. It was just work that I had to do. I was the janitor, you know, I had to kind of sweep all the bits out the door. Um, we went through a rather long series of alpha, beta, I believe there was a delta and a gamma of the 1.0. I think, huh? Is that the four? Huh? Yeah, and I believe there was a delta that didn't, it didn't live very long. There was an epsilon too, but I don't, huh? I don't, you know, the, and these weren't, these were test releases of me just making sure that we had bits that everybody could run um, and, and had a way to get them to people. Somewhere, and I recently found it, I have the, what's called the golden copy of the final 1.0 release that was actually sent out from Walnut Creek um, for pressing. Um, at that time, we couldn't even we couldn't master a CD. I had to haul all of, I had to pack all the bits up once we had them in a shape that we liked and take them over to a Sun Four. And Bob Bruce actually did the burning of the very first um, what they call a one-off. That led. Um, I don't know whether it's, it, it was unfortunate for Bill Jolison that he couldn't attend this conference called NLUG. I'm going to call this the Zeroth BSD conference, or at least the Zeroth free BSD conference, in that um, because of his cancellation at NLUG, someone in the Netherlands, this is the Netherlands Linux users group, um, I think I added one too many U's in there. They, they, huh? It's right? Is it right? Okay, thank you. I was, I, Unix users group, okay. The, the, they contacted Jordan about, well, we've got this slot open, we need somebody to come present. So Jordan contacted me and goes, look, we're going, we're, we're going to NLUG and we're gonna present about FreeBSD. Um, and it's gonna be me and you. Uh, those were decisions Jordan just, we're gonna go do this. Okay. I thought, well, okay, that sounds good. I didn't even have a passport at that time. I think the conference was, 30 or 45 days away. We were getting pretty close. Um, I had to run over to San Francisco to the consulate and file to get a passport. In those days, it was much easier, and they were able to get me a passport pretty quickly. Um, no, I need to back up on that. Well, that was, anyway, we went to NLUG. Some of the very early core team members and developers um, we're at NLUG, and I'm going to try and hit these names. I may not remember all of the people that were there that were heavily involved in the project. Um, I was there, Jordan Hubbard, um, Paul Hillingkamp, um, Guido Van Rogi, and Paul Richards. I know we're all there. Kirk McCusick was there, and Linus Torbasov was there. And we actually, me, Jordan, and Kirk went out to a dinner that night um, with Linus and some of the NLUG members, and that was the first time I ever had met Kirk, having been following his work for 10 or 15 years, 10 years at least, um, and it was the first time I met Jordan. I flew into the Netherlands and, and trained over to Utrecht 
and met Jordan an hour before we were going to give a joint talk. <laughs> That's also the last time I spoke in front of a crowd at a user's group of this size. That's literally the last BSD-related conference that I've attended. So I've been missing for 24 years from the conference arena. <laughs> so. At the same time we started the FreeBSD project, uh, Chris Dimitrescu and a few others at the university had started up the NetBSD project. And I think they actually they got named and started a month or two, a month before us. They they, they were kind of um, they started as as soon as 386 BSD was out. I'm pretty sure that that they they started that project. Kurt may know. I can't remember. Did, Net, did, did NetBSD start the project after Bill had released 386BSD, or, or were they already started? It was right after. Yeah, I think it, I think they actually started while we were, huh? Well, that was the same reason that we started. I mean, there was the patch kit had been created as as an external mechanism to try and deal with some of it. But yeah, I, okay. Anyway, the there was a large feeling in the community that but this may not be the best thing for the futures of the BSDs to have two different forks that were basically doing the same work. Um, I was actually a very early contributor to NetBSD because of the patch kit stuff because they picked that stuff up and used it too. Um, and so there were several meetings between me and Chris Dimitrescu, and I don't know if I'm saying that name even close, Kirk. You would know. Dimitri Dimitriou. Okay. Um, to try and merge the two teams and not have two separate projects. And unfortunately, that has met with failure on at least the two attempts I made at it, and I believe there was a later, a much, much later attempt to merge the teams that has not done. I think in the long run, this has been healthy for the BSD community to have multiple groups because it allows, it allows diversity in what's going on. Um, it allows some, it, it allows division of conflicting personalities which was some of the problems we had in the early days. I am not an easy person to get along with. You never, ever want to work for me. You just don't. Um, so we, those failed. Then we also had a little problem. This is a fairly famous problem that USL Novell started to sue BSD. And, uh, they start, we'll just call it the BSD lawsuit because they sued CSRG, they sued BSDI. They sent letters to Walnut Creek CD-ROM. For some reason, they picked my name and they sent me a letter. Um, and, and so we had this, this little problem. And there were some tainted bits that, that they didn't want out. Um, their, client, their initial claims were much larger. The um, final resolution on it actually ended up being, fortunately, a very small set of bits. Um, and, and so it, an agreement was reached, and for 10 years, that agreement was pretty secret. I've just recently learned that agreement is now public record, and that um, due to the statute of limitations and the Public Information Act and the fact that CS, that the University of California is a public entity, somebody managed to get it out there. So we can all read that agreement. I would encourage you to read it because there's, there's some interesting claims in it. It's, it is available on the, if you go to the wiki and look for the BSD lawsuit, the wiki will point you off to, yes, yes, Wikipedia. <laughs> this, this is, this is not, yes, not, a, yeah. <laughs> Well, is it? No, I think. Is it okay? It's on Grokla, but there's a link through their Wikipedia page too that points to the agreement. Yeah, I don't. Um, anyway, the the agreement was made, and that put us in the position of 
what do we do now? We have, we have a situation where we've done all this work in a repository, but that repository is technically contaminated, and there's different approaches to trying to fix that problem. Um, NetBSD's approach was to, I believe, addict the files that were in, in conflict and replace them. But that meant the files were now in the, the, the attic of their repository. Our decision was that, okay, we don't, it's not easy for us just to remove the history on these files. And we didn't want to do that because that creates a hole in the history. We also knew that, well, okay, 4.4 Lite is going to be the replacement for the solution of this. Um, and I can't, huh? It's just 4.4 Lite. It's, it's, the, it's the second release of 4.4 without the encumbered bits. Um, it wasn't called Lite 2, was it, Kirk? That, yeah, that was later. Yeah. Um, I made the contacts, and I think it's the very first time I ever spoke with Kirk, to, uh, for Walnut Creek to get a 8 millimeter tape of the 4.4 Lite sources. And that was simply done so that we would have one in a filing cabinet and go, yes, we've got that. We've done the, we've done the proper paperwork with the university to have a valid copy of 44 Lite. The tape was read once. Um, and, and the bits pulled out. And I'm not even sure that I, I did that to verify that the tape was good. That's not where I got the bits to do, import to the repository. I just downloaded those. Um, it was to make sure we had a tape that got stuck in a cabinet that we could actually be used in the future if we had to. Um, so we had to re we, is what we decided to do was re-import the sources. Basically, we picked 4.4 Lite up and brought those into the repository. Um, and there were the missing bits that had to be re-implemented. So this gave me, as the repository manager, a time window that I could work on how to import these bits. Because the first time it was done, fairly hastily, and I hadn't had a lot of experience with, with CBS at that time. So I spent a little more time. Somewhere there is a couple of hundred lines of shell script that actually did the import. It was all just automated. And that's because I could sit there and go through it and then look at how the repository come out and go, nah, that's got problems here, and go back and re-spin it while the development work was going on to replace the missing bits. Um, this creates some, some it's non-accessible history, but there are actually, almost, most of the repository has two versions of 1.1.1, or I should say there are two versions of the 1.1.1 files, which is what you get when you do an initial import. They're in two different places. There's two repositories. There's the old CVS repository and there's the new NCVS repository. So if you try and look at the sources from a 1.0 FreeBSD release, you will find a whole bunch of 1.1.1 files. And those may not match the sources that are on a 3. Dot, it was 2, 2 something, I think, is where we re-implemented. But anyway, I know they won't match the ones on a 3, where there were changes between 4.4 BSD and 4.4 BSD Lite. So there'll be a small number of them that won't match. But there, those 1.1.1 files are from two different places. Um, we lost some time re-implementing the bits, of course. Um, the, the, I, I was talking with Kirk the other night trying to figure out exactly what it was that had to be re-implemented. I seem to remember part of the VM system and part of the block I.O. system that got um, obscured because of the way things had to be removed. Um, and most of that work was done by David Greenman and, and a gentleman named John Dyson and it had to be white roomed. It was our first experience with having to do white room development. Um, David had been exposed to the source code, so he had a pretty good idea of what was there and basically um, fed John with, with APIs and here's what we have externally, so you go figure out how to implement something inside of here that works. Um, David had become pretty proficient with how the VM system worked internally and I think they actually made some significant changes into, from what we had before to what, what went back into the tree. I'm not sure if that was the first unified buffer cache implementation that they did, because I think they spun it at a later time. 
Um, in some of that processing, we did some things to the repository that are not so nice. I went through, there, there was, when we did NCVS, there were some bits that we knew were clean that were in our prior work. Anything that had been written after the 386 BSD 0.1 release by an outside party was clean um, because that wasn't, it didn't, it didn't have a CSRG lineage. So we, we brought all of those bits over. Um, there were, there was, um, there were some code from external sources like, did 4.4 ship with patch? We ran into this when we were looking at the repository. For some reason, there's an import of patch onto a vendor branch externally in the, in the very first days. So I'm still trying to figure out why. It maybe, was there a Berkeley patch and a GNU patch? Yeah, I think that's what, I think we, we, we imported the GNU patch because there were some features in it that we needed. I think the oh. version was from Larry Rowe. Yeah. Huh? The version of patch was written by Larry Rowe. Yeah. Okay. So it was an external, it was available externally from, yes. so we could actually, we could actually go back and grab all of that work and, and bring it in and not have to worry about being encumbered. Um, other things that happened later, because we had developed these habits, oh, it's okay to go over here and grab this part of the tree and repository copy it over here and leave all the tags there. Um, I now should go to AMD and collect a very, very large royalty check because evidently in 1993, I created the kernel sources for an AMD 64 architecture. <laughs> that, we've, 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 we just found this the other night when we were looking at the repository and there's some, um, I think it was John Baldwin, it keeps going, keeps going back in the tree and ends up at, at 1540 as a version number, when you backwalk almost anything in the kernel, you end up at this 1540 version. Um, and that's where the repository copy was done of the i386 bits to the AMD 64 bits. And when you do a repository copy, none of the dates get changed, none of the tags get changed, none of the authors get changed. So... We did actually change the tags, but the revision history in the output file doesn't change. It doesn't change. change. I thought the tags were still in there, though. We, no, we, 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 we renamed the tags so that they didn't... Oh, you renamed the tags. That's okay. They're still there. They're just renamed. Okay. <laughs> see, how, see how easy it is to mangle a repository? The, some, of the, some, of the side of, some, some of the side effects of this is you can't check out things by date and get a, mini, a, a tree that matches that date anymore because there's, yeah, you get, yeah, that's correct. You do, you do get all the files that were there and you do get the, the versions of the files that were there. You just get a whole bunch of other stuff that, was, that, that, that may have not been written 20 years before. Yes. <laughs> well, it, it, no. okay. I want to thank all of you because you're the ones that have made this project last 25 years. Um, some special thanks to Michael Dexter who couldn't attend this year, and that's why I'm here. Dan for keeping um, this conference put together and for Shanghai me into doing this. I had three days to prepare and I wanted to socialize so I didn't do a very good job of preparing. And, <laughs> and, and, and John Baldwin for, for the, the Dev Summit work that um, made it possible for me to just kind of socialize with all of you. If there's any questions, we've got, we're out of, I think we're right on time ending, but Dan says I've got time if you guys have some questions. Gwen. <laughs> I, you notice I did that reluctantly. When you drag me back. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, I, I think the challenge was already there, Peter. He's already been working on it. Doug? <laughs> that's that's up to the powers that be. Hey, no, no, that's really huh? That's really easy to solve. Why? Well, no, it's easy to solve, but it's up to some other powers. It's not at my request. Um, I don't think it's fair that I short circuit the process. I did submit a PR two years ago that's been committed. Oh, okay. We're actually. I'm supposed to work with Glenn later today to get my PGP keys back signed up so I can, I haven't been able to log into Freefall since sometime in 1998. I lost a hard drive that had my copies of the SSH keys, so, what? no, it was later than that, it was 2001 because we went, huh? It may be gone, but my home directory with my last sys source tree is still sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, we looked at some password files. I was trying to, to glean some history so that I wouldn't leave names out, and what I decided to do was basically leave almost all of the names out. Um, it was actually easier. Um, the password file was done sequentially initially, so that there was, there was a way for me to know very well when people joined the project. Um, Jordan jo or Justin Gibbs joined the project the day after me. According to the password file. <laughs> but we, <laughs> oh, that probably didn't get picked up, did it? <laughs> um, I believe that is Jordan's ID that he changed later. It, it, it only makes sense. Any other questions? No. No, this is, it, it, some, some strange events has, have happened that led up to this. The, there has been a, a Unix-related users group meeting in Portland, Oregon, which is where I'm from, for, I'm going to say, 27 or 28 years. Um, and I was involved with that in the early days. It has recently been restarted by Andrew Fresh, who's sitting down here, in the last year and a half. And um, somehow I had still been on the mailing list that had been there for the last five or six years. Ted Middlestadt, who was, who was a committer at one time. I don't know if he was a committer. He has a freefall account. Um, so he must have been a committer at one time. Um, hosts the, the mailing list that was used for that. And so I still got the mails. Because here's some interesting. Had Peter known that for the last 20 years he could have sent an email to rgrimes at freebsd.org, he would have. But he didn't, because he never thought to try it. <laughs> Neither did Julian Elsher, who, who I, uh, um, Michael Dexter was at a conference that had to do with storage products in the Bay Area about two months ago, um, maybe four months ago. Anyway, he, Julian Elsher was there, who's another very, very early project member. Um, he's a patch kit contributor, I'm pretty sure. He did our first SCSI code implementation. That, anyway, um, Michael called me and then put Julian on the phone. And, Ju and Julian's like, well, all right, how do I email you? I said, well, it's rgrimes at freebsd.org. And he goes, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so if you know of people that you haven't seen around the project and you're trying to contact them, you might just try their freebsd.org mailing list. Most of us left longstanding forwards. Um, the unfortunate thing of mine is it gets about 1,000 spams a day. Doug? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have enough conference time to talk about that. Um, I would have spent a lot more time with Justin, having have known that, that he was going to lead the foundation and be um, a figurehead would definitely be one thing. Anybody else? You're going to let me out of here this easy? Oh, a little of this, a little of that, but as little as I possibly can in the technical arenas. Um, I make gainful income operating an excavator for a gentleman. Um, I do some other 
physical type outwork. I do, I, I fall, I used to tree, I tree top for three years for a guy. Um, I do tree falling still on contract laborers. I do um, what's called precision tree falling where you're, you know, two feet down the side of the house. Don't miss. Um, <laughs> so far I've been pretty lucky. <laughs> Huh? How is that different from relief? <laughs> uh, mistakes are a lot more expensive because I can't, I can't just redo it. <laughs> um. Okay, there we go. New host. Uh, any others? I, I do do some contracting and consulting work. Some of it... Um, Oh, is, has been FreeBSD oriented. I'm still, believe it or not, I've actually been there in the background the whole time. I'm still running it. I have my own private lab and cluster and stuff. Um, and I have followed it from the background. I look at each release. I've, I've probably downloaded every release or at least every other release since um, 1.0. The, uh, Glenn's looking at me with a growl on his face because I, I, didn't, I didn't bother to point out some small anomalies and stuff that actually turn out to be really big headaches. Um, Everything is fine. Yes, it's, that's kind of what I want to say. It's not really that big of a deal. It, it causes me a little grief and just dealt with it and went on. Kirk. What do you like best about what's been added? Oh. I don't know if it's what I like the least. I was not happy with the conversion to SVN. That, I'm sorry, guys, but that, I'm sorry. I didn't, the, the, the gain versus pain factor for me was not very good when that conversion happened. And I was okay as long as CVS was supported as, as a, it was, the bits were still being shoved back into there, but when that got cut off, I had a huge pain factor. But that, I, can understand, I can understand why it had to happen. It's, just, it's reasonable. So that, that would be the, the thing I disliked the most. I don't know if that's really added to the code base itself or, um, or not. And probably the thing that I've, it's unfortunate, it's, hmm, you're asking me to dig through a lot of time, 20 years. Um, I can tell you what I'm excited about most recently, and that's the implementation of a, of a hypervisor, Beehive, and seeing that code come in. Um, for me personally, it gives me some roads to go down that I haven't been able to. I run, my cluster runs on ESXi, so I would just love to go <laughs> and swap, swap in Beehive for that. I can't right now, it's getting close. Um, if we could get nested hosting working, it would be a big boon because then I could just load ESXi under Beehive, and, and my cluster would be on Beehive, and then the migration becomes easier. Um, ZFS is a big win. I don't use it a lot, but from a technical aspect, I'm real, real happy to see that code. I guess that's, yeah. Last chance. Up in the corner, Michael Lucas. Which one? <laughs> and how many times? Glenn again. Thank you very much for all the work you did in the past that brought us all here today. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really you and people like Dan that start, start conferences and John that have kept it going. All I did was start the wheels rolling. That's it, we're done. <laughs>